start off with a few introductions. My name is Paul Taplin. I was one of the original founders of Vorja Solutions 20 years ago. And I know many of you know that that would have made me eight years old. Um, but um, I really wanted to talk to you today about a topic that we're all really passionate about at Vorja, which is intelligent automation. Um, but we want to come at it from both a robot angle, but also a people angle for the time. <coughs> so first question though, probably a, a really good place to start would be just to give you a little bit, bit of background about who we are. Um, I mean, how many people have heard of Voyager Solutions? Few, few. So um, we are a, um, a small, medium-sized player in the consulting industry. We compete heavily against the big four consulting houses. Um, and really, our, our proposition is that we really occupy that space between the big four consulting houses and the technical providers here. So we work mainly with um, global FTSE 100, FTSE 350 companies and public sector institutions. We are relatively small in the marketplace, but we, we, we do pack a punch. We've got um, relationships with some of the big providers, such as Blue Prism and UiPath in this space. So that's the sales pitch. So this morning, we obviously talked about a lot of exciting technology that really starts to take us into the whole machine learning and artificial intelligence world. Um, and the world that we operate in is, is very much a, a back office world for us. Um, and so a lot of what I'm going to be talking to you about today is about the robotic process automation side, which is where the journey very often starts for our clients. Um, and as if it isn't bad enough that I'm going to go back a little bit on that, I'm also going to go back a couple of centuries just to talk about some of the principles that have led to where we are today in that robotic process automation space. So um, let's go back a couple of hundred years and <coughs> some of you might have seen um, some of the stories about this, this <coughs> automaton called the Turk that was a chess playing um, automaton, uh, uh, automaton and the, um, the idea was that a level of logic had been captured with this, this thing that looked like a human being that could pitch itself and play chess against... Um, a human, um, a human opponent, and, and actually the idea that there would have been the technology there through cogs and gears to, to actually simulate that logic is, is rubbish really, and there was just a person in a cabinet underneath the thing. Um, but I bring that in because that's probably where some of the robotic stuff comes from in terms of, of being able to simulate that logic in some form. Um, and then First time a business change manager was probably required when automation was introduced um, to mills and in, in that industry. Um, many of us will have heard of the, the term Luddite, um, and, and this was a movement that went around um, smashing up some of, the, some of the equipment within the mills. But the term Luddite really refers to what the economists at the time were saying, which was that it was actually good for society and it was good, it was good to have this automation. So, second thing to bring in is there are benefits from doing this stuff. Then, the term robot, there's probably academics in some part of the world that are arguing about whether this was the first use of the term robot, but um, a guy called Capet put together a play called um, Rossum's Universal Robiti, Rab Rab and, um, and that, that was all about this synthetic, human-like thing that obviously, to make the story interesting, eventually caused absolute havoc. So I think that there was probably a decision about whether to call that a consultant, <laughs> or my own industry, I know, um, or whether to call that a robot, but that, that, is, that is where the, the term robot comes from, apparently. And then, obviously, artificial intelligence, um, which, which did exist back in 56, um, and again, the the first term um, of that was put together by a group of academics that had a conference um, at Stanford and, and, and came up for, with that definition. Now, obviously, we didn't really hear a lot about artificial intelligence for many, many years um, within business. A lot of it was educational uses initially, um, but that was the first time that that expression was used. And then, obviously, as we got more into physical robots and industrial applications, um, we, we found that the first application of, of a physical robot that will have, have followed a sequence of steps and followed the very 
well-defined same steps time after time again. Um, a GM facility in um, Ewing, New Jersey, um, and, and a robot called Unimate that was assembling die castings. So if we fuse all of those things together, we've got something that follows the same set of rules over and over again. We've got a level of automation that is believed to have some benefit attached to it. And we've got potentially a world pointing towards artificial intelligence. And what I'd like to do is start off with the definition of robotic process automation. Um, I mean, anybody in the room know what it is? Definition? A few should. Oh, cool. Right, so when we think about automation, we very often think about macros and stuff that's just helping us do our day job a little bit easier sometimes. Robotic process automation is about putting a software robot onto a machine or in a virtual environment that does exactly what the human user does. So the difference with robotic process automation is that you're putting a robot on that sits on, I think IT people call it the presentation layer, um, that is actually simulating being a human being. So it's logging into SAP or PeopleSoft, it's opening up Excel, it's checking its emails, and it's going across a number of systems. But robotic process automation is the bit where the robot does exactly what it's told to do because it's following some sort of flow chart over and over again and it never learns from that and we're we're finding those robots a lot in back office situations um, where there's there's a repetitive rules based set of tasks the artificial intelligence and the big data bit and the bit that everybody's calling the ecosystem um, can be built upon from robotic process automation but if we start with the definition of the robots, it's probably a good, a good place to start. But for, before we do that, we've probably got to keep the accountants happy um, because a lot of this stuff starts with a benefits case. And in our experience, I'll show you a robot in a minute and I'll make a joke about getting it out of its cage that sometimes gets a laugh, sometimes doesn't. Um, but, but when we look at the business case for those software robots, um, we're looking at things like outsourcing, where if we've outsourced something, we probably outsourced it because it was rules-based, transactional, high volume, and those criteria that we very often use when we were starting to outsource everything, particularly around back office in shared service centers, um, it's the same criteria that we can use to decide whether to put a robot on something, or it's at least the cousin of that criteria. So... We very often go into an organization and ask the question, where have you outsourced stuff? Where are you going to outsource stuff? Or where are you going to try and increase the volume in a particular department? And you want to do that without um, bringing on board extra human beings. So there's always that reduction in direct processing cost, the ability to take on more workload. But also there are very strong cases for using robots where you've got an upstream or a downstream data quality um, issue potentially. So where where inputting data the same way every single time could lead to benefits much further down the line because you've got you know that if a robot's done it and it's done it exactly the way that it's told to do it, that data is going to be correct. Um, but also in a lot of areas, if we think about a typical organisation. Um, we're deploying robots in some departments where you might have um, a management information team that's producing daily reports and maybe those daily reports are being produced by three o'clock um, and if you put a robot on it and that robot cranks through all the stuff overnight those reports can be there when the people get into work in the morning and they can start hitting the phones and chasing cash or whatever it is they do with that reporting uh, much sooner. So there's a big case for conducting value-added activity. Um, but also there's a secondary benefit from using them in that the robot will show you and tell you exactly what it's done. And that means that from an improvement perspective, you can very often get benefits because you, can, you know exactly what that robot did. It's produced a log. Um, we'll come on to security a little bit later. I was dreading there being a security person in the room, but... <laughs> Hello. Um, so, <laughs> we will come on to it. Um, 
So, so when, when, we, when we come into robotics, we're very often um, looking at a, a business case. If you start with the financials, um, there are a number of different products, and I'll show you a robot in a minute. Everyone's getting excited now. Um, but generally, the, the ones that we deploy, they can roughly do the work of about three FTEs, basically. Um, and generally, if you look at the different vendors and the different way that they package these things up, they cost around £8,000 a year in licensing. So the business case is around £8,000 a year does the work of three FTEs. But there's a lot of additional cost around it. There's consultancy cost, there's IT cost. So where we very often find a typical level of benefit is maybe a client that wants to start off with one robot and they very often, maybe they'll find a benefit of one FTE, uh, maybe you know, maybe 30,000 annual benefits, something along those lines. And, and, and if we put one robot in, um, they can generally get just about that business case back in if they want to start off on a small scale. Um, a lot of our clients um, would, would typically be enterprise level and enterprise scale organizations that have an intention of putting quite a few of these things in. Um, and so also for us, um, we very often find a start point where they'll maybe buy three robots, which is about the equivalent of about 10 FTEs, and, and sort of build the business case up around that. And we very often go in, when we're trying to figure out where to use these things, um, we very often go in um, with some kind of heat map exercise um, that, to identify whereabouts in the organization you can deploy these. And many of you will recognize balance scorecard kind of stuff going on there as well. So what we're looking for is we're looking for a financial opportunity potentially um, in some areas where you want to increase the volume of work in a department, but you don't want to increase the headcount or you're going to offshore something and you, you, you're considering the use of robots or you're bringing offshore activity back in. So the financial opportunities are very often identified that way. But also um, there are examples of where you can get direct customer benefits from using robots as well. I'll give you an example. Um, insurance company, somebody phones up and asks why a renewal's gone up. So they phone up a call centre, person answers the phone. Um, and if it's a complex insurance product, sometimes the insurance agent might have to say to that person, what I'll do is I'll contract the actuaries and they'll give me the calculations and I'll give you a call back in a few days um, with, you know, with the calculations and we can talk through it. If you put a robot on that and the robot could handle all the rules and logic around that calculation and that robot could present it instantaneously while the agent is on the call, obviously there is a customer experience benefit in doing that. So there are a lot of use cases that are tied into that. There are also use cases tied into where, let's take a health and safety area that produces management information and that needs to produce it faster. There might be process opportunities, there might be audit opportunities, uh, regulatory and legal opportunities by deploying these robots. And then right at, the, right at the back end of that, obviously we get into all sorts of questions around well, what are the people are going to do when you put the robots on? And it's the whole discussions that we would have had about offshore versus, you know, maintaining work um, within the organization, within the country. Um, so there's obviously an efficiency thing going on there. But there are also um, many use cases where if we are able to free up um, time of an individual um, so that they can do more value added activity, then you do start getting into areas of, of job enrichment, you know, maybe in an environment where um, people would normally have to do a lot of processing before they attack the queries and got on the phone. So there, there is very often a people benefit that we identify as well. Uh, but realistically, most of our clients are starting off with some kind of financial benefit in order to, you know, to obviously pay for the thing and get those in. So what I'm going to do to start off with is I'm going to get this pretend robot that's my little joke that nobody laughed at out of its cage. Oh, they are now. That's fine. Um, and, and really, um, many of you, I mean, uh, there are organizations in this, in this room that use some of these products. Um, but really, the ones that we are very often finding in this whole world of robotic process automation, 
uh, UiPath, Blue Prism and Automation Anywhere, uh, depending on which graph you plot and which, whether it's Gartner or Everest or whoever it is, there's a whole set of vendors that are all kind of fighting for that top space. Um, these just happen to be the three that, that we get to, um, that are talked about quite often for us. And I'm going to show you, I'm going to introduce um, one of them to you just to, with a short video to give you an idea of what they actually look like. Have you ever wondered what robotic process automation or RPA can do for you? In short, it provides a competitive advantage by helping you improve both accuracy and speed of operations while radically driving down costs. So how does it work? In this video, we'll show you how UiPath streamlines an invoice process end-to-end. -end. You are about to see a robot performing the following activities. Monitoring a dedicated folder where invoices are saved in PDF format. Reading invoices from that folder one by one. Extracting key information from the invoices. Opening SAP. Filling in invoice details in SAP. Sending email notifications. Please note that the robot will do some activities in the background, such as most of the invoice related actions, monitoring a folder or checking its email address. Now let's see it working. Right now, it's monitoring a folder where three invoices are stored and collecting all the information needed so we can register them one by one. It then asks the tester to introduce the email address where the posting notification will be sent and also performs basic checks to see if the SAP is open and runs it on its own if not. Logging into SAP using its credentials, it then starts processing the invoices one by one. We can see it filling in data such as vendor code, invoice date, invoice number, invoice amount, invoice description, and GL account, and ends up by filling the payment term. Following that, it registers the remaining two invoices in the assigned company code. An email containing the SAP registration number is sent automatically by the robot after successfully registering each invoice. Checking in the background, the robot verifies whether the VAT on the invoice matches the one in our database, and if so, will post it automatically. Otherwise, it will park it and send a dedicated email to the responsible person highlighting this difference and asking what to do. Post the invoice or to cancel it and send it back to the vendor. All the invoice's details are visible in the email it sends, so let's reply with yes to the message for an invoice with a VAT difference. Finally, it will check its email address in the background, access SAP using the appropriate transaction code, and post the invoice. And that's it. The robot has successfully posted the three invoices in SAP. Do you want to know more? We're happy to help. So, um, probably a little bit loud, sorry about that. Um, that gives you a flavour for the kind of activities that the robots can typically perform. Um, and a, a, you know, a very typical scenario for us is one where we're maybe in a shared service centre, maybe it's you know, finance or HR, for example. There's a lot of Excel stuff that people are bringing up and they're loading one by one into various systems such as you know, SAP or PeopleSoft. Um, and I thought I might be interested just to, just to show you um, how the things are set up. So UiPath, if anybody of you have ever seen it, 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 it is set up around um, really going through a flow of activity. Um, this is another product. This is a product called Blue Prism, and this has a very similar way of setting it up. And actually, um, what your... No, hang on a minute. Sorry about this. I'll just go back. Um, so what, what you're effectively doing when you develop it is building up a flow chart 
of, of activity. Um, and what the robot is doing is it's following that flow chart and it's going in and out of the target applications. So when we, some people talk about training the robots, but really what you're doing is you're, you're telling it that it needs to follow this set of flow charts. And while, whilst doing that, um, and you know, and here's an example of, of one where we've got a target application that just happens to be a, a web-based application. You are going in and out of test systems initially. So yeah, the, the security chat, they're test systems initially. So um, sorry, I will stop going on about security in a minute. Um, but basically, so, so you're basically setting up a test, a test application. The robots are learning how to follow these flowcharts and going out of those applications and follow logic, basically. Um, now, they will, they will generally um, go in and out of most applications. So if you can do it on a system, the robot can generally do it. The, the question is more about whether there's actually a business case for doing it. So um, if you've got a process flow where you've got, you open up Excel, you go into SAP, you cross-reference on another legacy system, you drop an email to somebody, it'll handle that multiple, and they call it swivel chair um, type scenario. And the more you feed it with all of this logic, the better really, because it will do it the same way over and over again. And then beyond the robots, um, there's this, this, this concept. We talked a lot this morning about using artificial intelligence and machine learning, really getting into some of those applications. And... What a lot of organizations do is they start off with robotic process automation. So they start off with the middle bit, the middle bit that gets these robots following flow diagrams that just do the same stuff over and over again. And actually, the robots themselves can call in and out of other systems. So if you had a, an application where um, you, were, you were creating sales orders in an SAP system, um, the robot, the robot could go into SAP as part of its flow diagram. It could also go into a product like IBM Watson and ask IBM Watson what it thinks the weather's going to be and what impact is that going to have on sales of water. Watson's going to do its magic as an as an artificial intelligence platform and come back in, and then the robot just takes that data and it just does its magic stuff and enters it into the you know the SAP system. So there's a lot of stuff where the robots can talk to these systems, but there's also a lot where um, the vendors are getting together in this thing called the ecosystem and they can, they can much better integrate and they have some of the functionality built into them. So um, the other thing to consider is where learning technology fits into all of this world as well, because... Um, I'm going to... I think... Yes, it worked. So in this example, this is an example of where um, this is a human user now doing some ordering on SAP, but a learning technology is going to stick its oar in in a minute, and it's basically going to know what the human user is doing. And we've seen many of those. They call it context-sensitive stuff. But in this application, as the human user types the order in, the learning application has intervened knowing what it's doing and it's bringing up a bit of weather forecast information that relate to those dates that's relevant to that business process. So in the learning technology world as well, the learning technologies are attacking the robots because they're now starting to have more intelligence and be able to go off and do stuff and become more, more effective assistants themselves. Um, so you know the, 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 the different digital worlds are all colliding together. So in this example, this is where we bring a chatbot into the, into the application. Um, and and, and, and this, is, this is a product called Core AI. There are a number of chatbot um, products available. Um, and you, you, you can see for yourself what's going on here. So the employee is querying a chatbot somewhere to find an employee list, basically. Um, and then the, the chatbot is responding by... Um, coming back with that employee list. So, and then it's asking for a specific person's details. Now, this is, um, 
pretty, pretty basic example, but if you imagine that any query that you might have with a shared service center, um, if it knows who you are as an employee, because it will because you're in a, in a sort of a chatbot situation, then it's going to be able to look up anything that you want it to look up because it's got your details and it can cross-reference. So the chatbots can interface with the robots or sometimes those chatbots have got their own technology and their own logic built in anyway. Um, but if we then start to add some of the cognitive and artificial intelligence stuff that we talked about this morning into that mix, um, we start getting a world where um, some of these, these bots interact um, with people and they start taking the workload off them. We go home and we ask one of these products for a, a recipe or to order some shopping or whatever it is we do with them at home. We could be coming into the workplace and asking a project bot what the actuals were from a project three years ago and you know how does that correlate against a particular project now and we're not we're not there yet obviously we need to we need to bridge some of those gaps um, but if we start adding in machine learning and natural language processing into that mix so the individual user is liaising with the bot and the bot is getting much better at interpreting natural language so that you can ask it to do four things at once and it'll do four things at once. And then it's also learning because it knows that it made a mistake the last time and it won't make that mistake again. You can see that that whole world just starts to join up and get a lot more powerful. Um, and if we wanted to get a little bit complicated about this, we'd say that once you've got the robots in that are following these process flows or however you've set them up, they can then talk to these various different worlds that I refer to as the ecosystem. So they can talk to the assistants, they can control the bots, the bots can be an input to them so that they can do stuff. Um, and also in the machine learning space, you can see that if you start putting machine learning and AI into that world, you really do start to, to get an experience that practically brings in a lot of the stuff that we talked about this morning into a business environment. And, and I know that later on, you're going to be, have the opportunity to look at some of the demos of some of these products. Um, I think Google have got some, some, some demos along the way, but these are some of the products that we're, that we're um, coming across in our world. Our world normally starts with helping a customer to build a center of excellence that starts with robotic process automation, but they then use that to get into other areas and, and, and to really think, well, if I do a heat map, Maybe I'll do a heat map to see where I could use AI or machine learning, you know, with this. Um, but in our world, back office operations, we're coming across more of the basic robotic stuff than we are this stuff at the moment. But those clients that have built those centers of excellence are now starting to think about this and start to move into some of this. And obviously in the customer world, we do have clients that are using robots as assistants, you know, when people are on calls and, 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 and handling it um, really as what they would call an attended robot that's just sitting there helping you. But it's people that run robots. And so the impact on us uh, as people that work in these various organizations is that we're probably going to have to think about how are we going to identify where to use these robots and how are we going to govern them and put standards in so that everybody just doesn't go mad and starts buying robots and having them all over the place. Um, like a learning center of excellence that, that might, might very often get involved in knowing what's happening across the organization with learning technology and standards and life cycles and everything else, uh, a lot of organizations build an intelligent automation center of excellence. And that has the people in there that know where the process opportunities are, run the steering groups, organize, the whole world that starts to evolve around robotics and intelligent automation. There's very often an operational team. One of the things that is very particular to robotic process automation is it's very often the business people that come to us and ask us to deploy the robots because they're deployed as a virtual workforce. So very often the first engagement to us might be from an operational team, might be from a finance or a HR shared service center lead that says, I think if we use robotics, 
we could get some serious volume through you know, our shared service center. Um, and because the software sits on what's called a presentation layer, um, it sits and operates above everything like a human user. So it's using the same applications. It's using SAP, PeopleSoft, whatever it is the applications are that are being used. It's not attempting to change those in any way. It's just using them and logging into them. So the operational team, when we set these things up, we very often sit with subject matter experts from the operation, from you know, wherever it's being deployed, and they, they very often tell us what the robot does. So we create a little flowchart thing, screenshots, bit of data, design documentation, and set the robots up on that basis. Now, everybody thinks that in order to make a robot happen, you've got to do weeks and weeks of design workshops and things like that. These are relatively short bursts of transactions. So when we put them in, we very often liaise with a subject matter expert in the area for a short period of time um, to, to gather the basic information. Then we do the design bit. Then we, then we do the implementation bit of it. So in an operational team, um, it's very often the people in the business that run the things. They come up with the ideas of where to implement them. And they own the day-to-day the -day running of them because they're a virtual workforce. And then finally... Um, Sometimes IT drive all of this anyway, because they've got their own use cases around things like test data and stuff like that anyway. Um, but obviously from an IT perspective, we need to engage the person that owns the application that the robots are gonna be um, using, and we need test environments and things like that for them. So there's very often a target system owner. Um, we also need to um, engage with the, the, the parts of the organization that are concerned about policy. So risk and control, um, obviously security. If you're giving something a login um, ID onto the system, there are questions around segregation of duty um, and, and, and various other elements. Um, but there is a set of policies that we need to figure out in order to make these things happen. But generally, we can get them in within very often release cycles of about 12 weeks. And, and, and we have a model, this is why we partner with QA, where our model is all about developing capability with clients, building up their own centers of excellence, upskilling their own people. Um, and so it's very often our own, our own um, client colleagues that are actually operating and developing these things in the end. Um, and what I'm going to finish off with is, is um, I thought I'd, I wouldn't be a consultant if I didn't show you a very complicated plan. Um, but, but, but really to give you an idea of, of, of what the implementation and deployment looks like of these things, um, we, we would tend to focus on um, an organization coming to us with a proof of concept to say, uh, you know, I, I really want to have a look, see whether it's going to work. Um, and so we would, we would run a proof of concept process, get an evaluation copy of the thing on a machine, um, and then really run, run a, put a life cycle in where they can put more of these things in in future. Um, and very often it starts off with, robotic process automation and they get used to being able to handle that and they then go into um, scaling that into some of these more advanced intelligent automation products. Um, and then there's obviously a lot of governance needs to happen, the establishment of a steering group, the identification of, of process logs that help you understand where in the organization we think we've got benefits. So there's quite a lot of kind of heat map type stuff going on. Um, and with, within IT, we need to engage IT to get the robot on the system, but also to get the target applications on the systems. And obviously, the ongoing discussions with risk and control stakeholders. Now, I've shown you that not to try and bore you at the end of the presentation, but more um, just to give you a feeling that, that this, is a, this is a process that is, I don't want to use the word agile, but, but there, there is, this is quite a fast process. Once it's up and running, people are deploying these robots very often, you know, in a six week period um, and, and, and they're really starting to add, add to them um, you know, a, a, as they go through. So that was really um, what I wanted to say about intelligent automation. Um, it wasn't that exciting when you saw the demos, but, but all they do is exactly what a human user does. Um, but hopefully it's giving you a feel for what some of the possibilities are in business and how a business um, or any institution can start off with, with, with a basic set of robots and then start moving into some of these other areas. So um, we are handling questions at the end. So thank you very much for being an audience, some of which got my jokes.
Um, and we'll cover questions at the end. Thank you very much.